Uh, as we stated last week, we will continue with the series of discussions with the one and only Jordan Maxwell regarding religion itself, and this is an interesting subset of discussions. Uh, not only is it a subset for this show, but a subset for Jordan, because quite honestly, Jordan Maxwell has done a variety of presentations about various things. I have not seen a focused discussion like this from Jordan Maxwell elsewhere. Perhaps there is one, but uh, I don't know about it. And I've got to say that uh, Jordan has certainly provided us with some interesting information in part one, and we will continue here without very much further ado. Um, it, it is available at Ocelli.com, on YouTube, and in various other places, and we will continue to make this entire series as available as possible to everyone. That simple. Now, if you don't have ears to hear, this is not something I can, well, concern myself with. Uh, I'm doing the best I can <laughs> to be sure that this is out there, and so is Jordan. Um, so, first off, how are you tonight, Jordan? Well, it's very good, and I guess we'll find out <laughs> as we go along. But thank you for uh, having me back on. Oh, absolutely. We're going to continue this every Monday until uh, Jordan is completed or, you know, has completed, excuse me, is completed. That's strange. Until Jordan has completed uh, this particular series. And there is no uh, predetermined number of presentations that will be done here, but we'll continue them every Monday until we get there. Um, now, certainly we, we've begun with a, a, a wide variety of topics uh, in the first two hours. And I got to say that uh, this one is going to be extremely interesting to me because, you know, currently we have a lot of debates regarding Christianity and exactly uh, how much law is based on Christianity, how much of people's behaviors are based on Christianity, especially in the Western world. Um, you know, America is a Christian nation, according to some people. There are various political parties that apparently own up to Christianity. Uh, the churches own this and that regarding uh, people's behaviors and what is right and what is righteous. In fact, uh, I find it fascinating that a lot of people have these discussions without ever examining the basis for them. Uh, certainly, we, we've gotten a little bit of hot feedback already on the first presentation, and I think this one is going to, well, make it worse. And uh, that'll be just fine, <laughs> because yeah, I'm more than happy to take the heat, as, as I know you are, Jordan. Uh, because, look, when you're speaking the truth and you're getting some sort of reaction to it, it's not always going to be positive. And, uh, you know, look, what, what, what can I say? I've said several times that I will know that this planet has come to a, a, a greater moral apex than we have ever imagined the day that there are no churches and there are no prisons on the surface of it. Um, because to me, churches and prisons are both immoral institutions, and they are certainly both institutions. But enough of what I have to say, Jordan, the basis of Christianity, um, the people that are arguing about it, debating it, owning it, wearing it as a shield out there in public, it seems as though they don't even understand what they're speaking about. Well, unfortunately, that's the case in religion throughout the world, actually, and in fact. <clears throat> we have Muslims all over the world and raving about the Muslim religion and, and holy, holy, holiness to Allah and peace be upon him and all of that. Never for a moment even beginning to understand where the word Allah actually came from. <clears throat> and what Allah actually has represented for hundreds of years before Islam even existed, and why Allah is even in the uh, Bible and the and the Jewish uh, Old Testament, <clears throat> you can find Allah there also. Uh, it's a very interesting story, and we'll get into Allah and Yahweh and the Jewish religion. Uh, but tonight I want to talk for a little bit about uh, Christianity because I have the highest of respect. For one thing, I, I should preface my comments by saying that I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. I never have been. I'm too smart to know how much I don't know. So I'm not, I'm not a world-class authority. I've just been reading and studying 
uh, the subjects I deal with since 1959, which was almost 59 years ago. So I'm just interested in theology and government <clears throat> and all of the other institutions that man has developed for himself <clears throat> and trying to control the rest of mankind. And so I understood a long time ago <clears throat> that uh, religion is just a way of controlling the masses of people and the consolidating political power. Um, I, no, I, I used to, when I was a teenager, <clears throat> I really was interested to go with my friends to their churches. And I think I went to every kind of church that was in town. Uh, and, and even since then, I've gone to many, many different church services. And the reason why, as I was searching for, specifically searching for, intellectual, spiritual understanding of the conceptual ideas of God and spirit and the, and the preter, uh, the preternatural, the word is preternatural, meaning uh, things which are not of this world because I've always been very spiritually minded and fascinated by the, the darkness of the spirit world and what's going on on the planet, where we came from and all of that. So I used to go to all the different churches seeking wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And I, dis I, 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 I discovered that uh, there is no such a thing as wisdom, knowledge, and spirituality in religion period. Religion is a political, sociological way of collecting people in a powerful uh, setting for politics and for control. It has nothing to do with God, whatever that means. It has nothing to do with spirituality. Uh, so this is why today uh, all over the world, Christians are praying uh, in churches to God to protect them, to bring a better time for life, and to uh, and to uh, protect their family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the more people are praying in churches to God for security and peace, the worse the world gets. And so, I, it, that, you know, it doesn't take a giant to figure out. <clears throat> that somebody's praying to the wrong God, or God is not hearing you. And so I am of the opinion that uh, that there is, in point of fact, what people have uh, imagined as God, some sort of an all-encompassing divine principle or force in the universe, which is highly, extraordinarily intelligent, very wise and very powerful, and can uh, and can supersede any of man's plans. Uh, it, it is the ultimate power in the universe, some sort of an unseen power that men over the centuries have called God. With that, with that idea and that concept in mind, I don't have any problem with God at all. I totally believe that there is a higher power to which mankind is subservient. And there's, so there's no problem with my belief in God. But the more I understood and studied theology and religion, the more I became aware, as you would also if you spent years doing it, that uh, there is a very big difference between spiritually understanding the, uh, the universe as we live in it or just going to church, which churches are governments. And churches, like governments, are corporations. They're companies. And, and as all corporations operate, they need money. And so churches are merely an extension of government. And if you go back into the ancient and prehistoric world, I would say go back seven peoples were also the gods who control those people. So 
the leaders of the nations were also the high priests that connect, you know, that talk to God. We even have presidents today who say they, they talk to the Lord. And the Lord said, go in there into the, uh, into the desert and kill them all, you know, because they talk to the Lord. Well, this is what has been happening for thousands of years. The political leaders want to be in the position to lead the people into a divine relationship. Well, I understand that I've looked at it for some 59 years, and I understand that uh, there is no actual hope uh, to be placed in any religion, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. All three are man-made corporations, institutions that are being put together, organized, directed, and financed by secret societies and occult orders in the world that most people are not even aware of. So, <clears throat> I mean, you've heard of the words the Illuminati and, and the hidden government. Well, these are the people who come up with your religions and your banking and your military and your educational institutions. But so many people don't realize that you're not going anywhere with religion. You need to start thinking for yourself in a spiritual understanding of your life and who you are. Well, so I'd like to ask I, a question at this point, Jordan, because, you know, one might take what you've just said as uh, it's sounding as though nothing um, of significance in the ethereal sense happens due to religion. And what I what I wonder here is that when someone religiously does anything, it means that they repetitiously repeat an action. Uh, you could say that you religiously go to the movies even. And this no. would be an adequate statement and use of the language. Now, to participate in a ritual over and over again, uh, forget the church, but let's just you know, there are many different ritual practices in churches. Uh, the, the Catholics are loaded with them, but uh, many other churches have the, uh, you know, the, the, the wine and the bread and of the various course. steps and the singing and all of these things. So one would say that uh, it, it's not merely a play that is uh, put on by government. OK, but uh, that there must be a purpose for it. Now, whether the participants know that they are purposed in the way they are is another question, but wouldn't you say that uh, that these activities that do happen there uh, do have a significance, but maybe not the significance that the flock, the congregation, the people that are not the priests, uh, even maybe the priests don't really know precisely what ritual they are participating in. Uh, is that at all possible, you think? Oh, I'm sure that's absolutely possible. Uh, it's it again goes back to the fact that religions are man-made. And since uh, men have come together and formed their understanding of how to control people and how to uh, you know, cut off your territory so that you own certain territories on the earth. And so a religion, because mankind has uh, in, encoded in, them, in the human being, it's almost hardwired in us, to want to look forward to a higher power to help us and to guide us. I mean, we start off as babies, and that's what a baby does. It looks to its parents to feed him and to take care of him and change his diapers. And as he gets older, you know, and the four and five and six years old, it becomes very dependent on the parent uh, for food and for taking care of him. And so by the time he reaches the ripe old age of in his teens, he realizes that, uh, you know, he requires uh, somebody to be there for him, his parents and government, the police or something, because he requires that uh, as, a, as a human. While animals, when they are born, instinctively come out to life knowing exactly what not to do and what to do and how to do it. And that's the way they take care of themselves. And the parents look over them the best they can, but the, but the, the baby uh, is pretty well programmed already. We call it instinct, instinctive reaction. So 
instinctive reaction in humans is that we look to dad to take care of us. We look to mother to feed us and take care of us and nurture us. So therefore, government, in point of fact, there is a law in the United States. I don't know exactly how to spell it, but it's pronounced parent patri. Uh, it's an actual federal law, parent patri. Uh, and you look it up in the dictionary or in the law book, and it will tell you the law says in America that the government of the United States is your parent. It actually owns your body. It owns your soul. And it owns you. And it's, it's a law, parent patrick. And so when you begin to see the connections between what, what are you talking about? Government owns me. Well, that's what it says. It's a, it's a law. And therefore you thought, well, you know, your parents don't own you. Well, God owns you. Well, that's what I said. The government owns you. And so, you know, when you look at all of these ideas and concepts, like I did when I was a kid and I used to ask questions and, I also always wanted to debate and question the, the, the religious leaders and you know, the church leaders that I would go and visit. I would ask if I could ask questions and, and you know in, in classes, and they would tell me, "No, we're not interested in uh, debating anything. If you wish to accept our religion and come to our church, fine, you're welcome." Uh, but we're not interested to debate anything with you, period. So that's the name of that tune. Well, uh, I, I was so anxious to talk with somebody to debate and discuss you know, my, my, my findings. As a kid, I was doing a lot of research on religion. And so now today, now that I have finally, uh, after all these years of talking and doing the best I can to be heard by the public, and doing radio for over 40 years and traveling around the world and doing lectures on theology and religion. Now I get people in churches and religious people calling and asking me if I would like to debate in the church uh, some of my findings, to which I try and be polite and say, I don't debate anybody on any subject at any time, period, end of sentence. Don't bother to even call me. I came to you as I was a kid, and I was honestly wanting to understand, and I honestly wanted to discuss my findings and do what you call debating. And you told me, no, you're not interested to hear me as a kid and hear what I had to say. So let me tell you something and understand it clearly. I'm not interested in debating anybody about nothing. All I do is go to the reference books, the encyclopedias, the, all the hundreds of reference books, and get an idea about what all of the all the authorities in the world are saying about a thing, and then do my own research. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm not debating anything. I'm just going to tell you what I've found. So I don't care if you believe it or not, or if you can understand it or not. Um, I've told this story before, I'll tell it again. When I was like about nine, I guess, I don't know, eight, nine, or ten years old, I was uh, born and raised a Catholic family. And when you get to be nine or ten years old, you are, there's a particular church service that is in the honor of a ten year old, and it's called uh, confirmation. And the idea is that you as a child uh, are born into a Catholic family, but you're not really confirmed a Catholic until you take the action and stand and say, I am a Catholic myself. And so it's called com confirmation. Same thing in Judaism. I think there's a, also a confirmation service in Judaism. And so we were told, I was told uh, in school, by the nuns, that um, tomorrow night at confirmation service, uh, the boys will all sit on one side of the church and the girls will sit on the other, and the bishop will be here in town. And this is a very special occasion for you children. He's coming here for your confirmation service. 
And so after the service, we were told by the, by the nuns, after the service is over, the bishop may perhaps, not, not necessarily, but he might ask the new children if you have any questions, and he will try and answer them for you. Now, if that happens, we were told, do not ask any questions, period. You keep your mouth shut. You don't have any questions. And so, you know, as a kid, I understood. So the next night after the service was over, and I think probably every Catholic in town was there because the place was crowded. And why? Because the bishop has come to town. So everybody wanted to be there. And so after the confirmation service was over, the, the, the bishop did precisely that. He said, well, if you children have any questions, now that you're confirmed Catholics, I'll try and answer them for you. Well, we all knew not to ask anything. So I stood up to make sure everybody in the church that was packed <laughs> would know who I am. It's me talking. So I... I stood up and I said, yes, Bishop, I have a question. I said, my father works with uh, with uh, torches, uh, like a welder. And, and, and I played with the torches. He's let me hold them and play with them. Uh, my question is, if there was an angel standing next to me, could I, if I had a torch that was burning, could I hit the angel with the torch? And burn him? Would it hurt an angel? And would it would it will it really burn him if I hit him with an uh, with a torch? And uh, and the bishop said, Well, of course not. And I said, Why not? And he said, Well, because first of all, you can't even see an angel, much less burn one. And I said, Well, if he's standing here and I can see him, and I aim the torch at him, my question is, Can I hurt him? He said, No. And then he, he went into something, uh, uh, talking about that fire is a natural phenomena. You need paper or wood or plastic or something to burn. You can't burn an angel. And I said, why can't I burn an angel? And he said, because angels are spirits. And spirits cannot be burned. You can't even see a spirit, much less burn one. You can't burn a spirit. And I said, well, then why am I so concerned about going to hell where my spirit will burn if you can't burn a spirit? And then the, most of the audience looked like a deer in the headlights. They had never thought about that. And so uh, I, I realized at that moment, because it was a red-headed Irish priest very close to me, and he pointed at me and said, you sit down and shut up. And I realized at that moment that I'm talking to people who are religious leaders who don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea in the world what they're doing. They're just making big money, traveling in fancy cars, eating steak dinners and living high and never are doing a day's work in their life and living off of other people who support them. And it's called religion. So I've had enough of that. I, I understand what's going on. Well, and, and here's a question I want to enter because of what you just said uh, again. And, and, I, and I hate to do this, but, you know, I'm looking at uh, Perrin's Patriae, right, which is uh, what, what you mentioned here. And most people would reference it as the thing which is brought into uh, uh, jurisdiction in a court where someone is incapable of taking care of themselves. And therefore, they are not, you know, they, they are generally handicapped or they are a child. Uh, they're someone who cannot make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, the court makes the decisions on their behalf. Right. Um, now, what's interesting here is I think people don't realize that unless you are a member of the Bar Association, you're not even capable of making decisions as far as the court is concerned. No, which that's is, precisely what the court says. That you yeah. are of unsound mind and are not able to make a decision because you're a child and you're of unsound mind and that's why you hired an attorney so an adult could speak for you. 
Uh, That's yes, what but, the law says. But you don't have to be chronologically aged at, you know, something less than 18 years. <laughs> no, um, no, 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 no. Just if you right. just hire a lawyer already, if you hire an attorney, that means you are of unsound mind. Well, I just wanted to point out that that is the exact parallel you're describing in your story here, which is that uh, although you were a child at the time, okay, um, you're not allowed to question these things. And in fact, you're not thinking correctly. So you shouldn't even ask questions, uh, just like you should not speak for yourself in a court. Well, that's true. Okay. I, I just wanted to point that out because since you mentioned it and I decided to, uh, you know, ma make sure I knew my Latin correctly here. <laughs> okay. Uh, because, you yeah. know, uh, I, I said to myself, wait a minute, that that's the thing that is invoked when someone is incapable of making their own decisions. And here's the thing. Uh, some people think that this only applies to the mentally ill and disabled and children. But yeah. realistically, it's everyone who is not certified to speak at the bar. Yeah, I know, I know, and that, that's okay. a whole subject of, you know, we could get into for six weeks. Oh, uh, oh, no, no, I just wanted to mention it since you made the perfect <laughs> parallel right yeah. there, because I, I wanted to tie those two things you said together, but uh, please continue. Well, and so I began my journey by myself and on my own, and I found that uh, the one thing, you know, people like uh, you know, as humans, we all like to have the best of everything. If you're going to get a car, you want the best that you can find. If you're going to uh, a restaurant, you want to eat the best you can. If you're buying clothes, you want to get the best that you can. So we humans like to have the best. We don't want to knowingly take uh, a second or third rate if we don't have to. We want the best. And if you own a, a very expensive car that breaks down, you don't want just somebody who knows something about cars. You want the best. You get the top of the line mechanic. If it's an expensive car, you want the best. But the one place that we have all humans have pretty well decided we're not interested in having the best. And that is in theology and religion. You're not interested in having the best. You're interested in what you're interested in. Your religion is what it is. That, you, know, you are what it is you are, and you're not interested in having the best because the best is someone who has studied the subject for some 59 years, somebody who has gone into all the intricacies of where these ideas and churches and belief systems have all come from and what the priesthoods mean and what the words and the terms and the symbols mean. That would be somebody you would want to talk to before you go into court. Somebody, before you go in and join a, a religion, you might want to talk to somebody who studied it for many, many years. But most people are not interested in doing that. They just get hooked into a car. They're either born into it. And, of course, that's the most important thing in, in a human's life. It depends on where you were born as to what you believe. If you were born in China, then you would have Chinese culture in your bloodline, in your family, and you'd have the Chinese ideas and thinking. And, uh, you know, it would not be something different or strange to you. This is who you are. You're Chinese, and you're born into a Chinese community. Unless, of course, you were black and born into a black community in Africa. You would have your own concepts and ideas that are that are part of the culture of your people. Unless, of course, you were born in Russia or Hawaii or Alaska or you know, wherever. It just depends on where you were born and what culture you were born into and what they believe, and that's who you are today. Does that mean that what you believe is true? No, that just means that's who you are. And therefore, my idea is it doesn't matter who you are and where you were born. Why don't you go back to school and learn how to read and then think and become very critical in your intellectual understanding of where things come from? Why do we have banks? Why do we have police departments? Why do we have to get a degree from a university uh, before you can be a minister and talk about Jesus? You have to have a degree. You've got to get the imprimatur of Caesar. 
on you, on you, and you have to have a diploma, and you have to graduate, which comes from two words, gradually indoctrinate. And so why do you have to submit yourself to all of this man-made governmental religious systems in order to operate? I mean, did Jesus go to the college? I mean, did the 12 apostles go to the university to get a degree? So they could, uh, could they, so they could preach, and so you begin to ask questions, and the more questions you ask, the more obvious it becomes that we humans have been tricked from the day we were born. We came into a world that was already nailed down, chiseled in concrete, and already decided. So you need to go along to get along. You need to be in compliance. With the, with the powers that be, and therefore you're not born free like an animal. You're born free. No, you're not born free. You're born into a man-made system. And you either go along to get along or you don't get a job. You go to school so you can get a diploma, and therefore you go to college, and now you get a work permit that lets you go out and earn it and get a job. Unless, of course, you, uh, you know, you're thinking for yourself and you don't have a diploma and a work permit. So I learned a long time ago, the entire world today on the earth <clears throat> is being guided by demonic depravity, lies, deception, and, uh, you know, government, secret societies, fraternal orders, organized crime. And this is why the human race in general around the world uh, turns to drugs, alcohol, violence. Uh, we go to, uh, you know, in America, we love watching cage fights where men lock themselves in a cage and, and, and try and kill each other and destroy each other. Uh, why? It's because this is the anxiety in the human. We know we're not free. And all humans want to be free. We are born free. But we are immediately sucked into some system. And then before you know it, that's who you are. And you don't ever change. And you don't ever question why it is you believe what you do. And so you're just a part of the problem now. One more of the seven and a half billion people on the earth uh, with an IQ of 40 having no, no idea in the world what it is you really you are doing, where you've been, where you're going, and when you die, where you're going to leave to. <clears throat> so I've just decided a long time ago when I was a kid to start doing my own thinking. And the more I began to look into the whole world of theology, it began, it began to become very clear to me that you need to go back and do your homework. You need to stand up on your own and by yourself and do your own research and begin to formulate your own ideas for yourself. And don't accept any man-made organization's ideas. Because when you, one day when you wake up and find out whatever it is, whatever church you have uh, put yourself into, whatever religious belief you have accepted, and then you find out that it was a lie, it was not true at all, it was man-made. Uh, then what are you going to do? You know, wait till you're almost ready to leave this world. And then you begin to think about where am I going? What have I done with my life? Nothing. You haven't done anything. You just went along to get along and all your friends that you lived for and, and what they were telling you and what they wanted you to believe, you, you bought into it. And now that they're all dead and gone and you are in the old folks home at 90 years old, you don't know where, what's going on. You have no idea what, what the religion was all about, what government was all about. As a matter of fact, you didn't know anything. You just drank a lot of beer and shot a lot of dope and watched a lot of uh, sitcoms. But your whole life was worthless, period. And this is something I'm not interested in. I want to know. You go to church, they ask you, well, are you a believer? Or how long have you been a believer? This is what in churches they ask you, if you're a believer. 
I say, no, I'm not a believer. I want to know, like government. Government doesn't care to be a believer. Government has CIA, NSA, and about 15 other underworld criminal organizations that watch everything you do. So they don't want to believe you're okay. They want to damn well know who you are. So there's a big difference between believing something and damn well knowing for sure where these ideas have come from. And this is what I do. I question authority. I question the whole idea of royalty, people who are royal, who drive around in limos and gold chariots and flip their cigarettes out on you and your children. And they, they live in, in luxury while you are trying to stay alive. Uh, this is insanity, the insanity of royalty, the insanity of holy men, and holy righteous people. So I've had enough of all of it. <clears throat> then I began to look intellectually and spiritually into anything of real value in Christianity. And I discovered that there is a hidden message. There's a hidden message in Christianity. It's a, it's a metaphor, and therefore I am totally convinced that for today that Jesus as a man never existed. I don't believe there ever was a Jesus, but I do believe that the story of his life is a metaphor. It's a symbolic, encoded story. And therefore, you can't just go buy a Bible and sit down and have a beer and read the Bible. And now you got the whole story. No, it's an encoded story. And if you don't have the right spiritual foundations to understand the symbols and what it really is telling you. So I, I realized that a long time ago. So I started looking at Christianity from a <clears throat> metaphor point of view and the spiritual implications of what is written in the New Testament. And I've discovered a fascinating code. And we've all heard about Bible codes. <clears throat> well, there is another code that you haven't heard anything about. And that is the encoded story of Jesus is a metaphor. And I am totally sure that if you follow through with the metaphor, it all begins to make sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so <clears throat> that's what I have done. I have I have been looking at this subject of Christianity and, and the life of Jesus as an encoded story. And here is where it gets interesting. When you understand and when you look at the Bible story of the New Testament, not as history. It's not history at all. It's a story cleverly brilliantly put together by by minds that are were being used by preternatural forces, people who were connected to the spirit world, like secret societies and occult orders that know things that you don't know, like George Carlin said. Those kind of people are in a big club and you ain't in it. But once you see how the, the priests and the higher-ups in religion have given themselves over to spirit demons and spirit powers, and they begin to, the spirits begin to talk to them and lead them to write, write and, and write scriptures. <clears throat> That's what Hollywood does. They have screenwriters. They have writers that write the script. And that's what we call scribbling. We scribble a script. And then we give it to the actor and he goes out and we photograph him, you know, saying what we told him to say. And we pay him a lot of money because he's very believable. He's an actor. So today you look at the Bible story of Jesus and you will see that it doesn't make much sense historically. But. When you understand it as a metaphor, it really opens up a can of worms. So here are the keys to understanding what I am saying about Jesus. The key is 
the bottom line on the New Testament is the oldest story that's ever been told. That's why the, it's, there are even movies uh, been made about the Bible story of Jesus called The Greatest Story Ever Told. Yes, it's the greatest story ever told because it's the only story. It's the obviously oldest story ever told. So it's the greatest story ever told. What are you talking about? The oldest story. The oldest story in the world is a war on the earth between light and darkness, period. It goes back tens of thousands of years to the ancient and prehistoric times of pre-Adamic man into the ancient and prehistoric times of the world that we live in. Tens of tens of thousands of years ago, when mankind was not sophisticated, they didn't have new cars and beautiful homes. Mankind was very unsophisticated, like an animal. And so he had to live uh, like an animal. And so he began to appreciate and understand uh, the way the universe and, and the way our earth works. And so he began to create for himself ideas and to explain the world that he lived in. So the biggest problem has always been when it gets dark, mankind is afraid. That's when evil things happen is at nighttime, especially tens of thousands of years ago, because at nighttime is when the animal predators come out and they're hungry. And you had better have built yourself a, a substantial house or a hut or something and stay inside because uh, because you are dinner to these animals and so when the sun would come up in the morning finally ancient man would know finally the sun is coming up now we can see what's going on outside and all the animals the predator animals they all go back in their holes and their dens and they, they they hide in there until nighttime comes again. So the bottom line for the ancient mankind was the sun comes up, it's man's world. He can see what he's doing. He has the energy from the sun to grow the flowers and grow plants, and, and he can feed himself. He can work and see where he's going and what's going on. But when the sun goes down, you better go in and lock the door. The predator animals are coming out again. So there's always been on the earth a war between light and darkness. Even today, there's a war going on today, and the Bible says, in the hearts of men. Some of us are totally in the dark, living our criminal lives. We have no idea in the world what's going on. We're just trying to live like an animal from one day to the next, making as much as you can. <clears throat> And, and then on the other hand, there are others who people we call who are enlightened. They live in the light. They're educated, intelligent. They live good lives. They're good people. They help other people. So there's a war going on on the earth between good and evil, between light and darkness. And that's the oldest story of the whole world. And so that's where Christianity begins. It begins with the encoded story that uh, there's a war on the earth between the light and the darkness, between good and evil, between a highly intelligent and, and incredibly stupid. <clears throat> so if you're walking around in the dark, uh, you know, then when somebody shows you something you've never heard before and explains something to you, uh, you say, oh, it just dawned on me. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. I see. What do you mean you see? You mean you understand? And, and and why do you? And then you said you understand how? Well, it just dawned on me. Dawn is a word we use when the sun comes up. In other words, somebody who was filled with light or intellectually brilliant was trying to explain something to you, and it finally dawned on you what they're saying, and now you have become enlightened on that subject so basically that's what i've tried to do is try and help people wake up 
and realize that the world you live in is not what you think it is. It doesn't work the way you think it does. The words don't mean what you think they do, and that English itself is a divine, is a designer language. It was designed purposely during the earliest Middle Ages to put a, a reference point to the English people so that you can understand certain things. It's a, it's a designer language. So we use words that were designed purposely for you to use to deceive you so that you think you understand something when you don't. So that's what I've spent my whole life doing, trying to educate my fellow man. Right. And a curious thing comes up to my mind as you speak about this. And uh, I wonder if in the last, because we'll take about another 10 minutes before we take a break here. But the reason that I interrupt here is because, you know, you evoke in my mind the idea that it's necessary to see that the evidence for what you're talking about is not something that is just coming out of your mouth. You can see over time that there was an oral tradition at one point telling this very same story. Uh, but it was told in different languages, in different places, with different characters' names before it was ever laid out in what we call the Bible today, right? Uh, the, That's the, correct. The story correct. of Gilgamesh, the story of Horus, the story of various deities, whether you want to count them as mythology or you want to count them as religion or you want to simply objectively study the stories of ancient people, you can see that there is a repetition here, that there is a continuous idea about the sun rising. Who were the original gods? They were the keepers of the sun. They were the children of the sun. They were the sun. Who is the sun? The sun is Jesus, S-O-N, of God, right? But he's also the S-U-N, and people have even pointed to the fact that there is an astrological significance to the story if one understands how the stars yeah. come about and, and are shown to us in the sky, and the representation of the cross, the sacred cross, which pre-existed Christianity, by the way, and that's a whole other story. I mean, another night we'll get into the historical areas here. Yeah. But but I think that uh, but but I think that you're you know obviously this is not just Jordan's knowledge, but this is what you come to see as relevant to get people to understand the code here. And there is a code, and and that is why when sometimes uh, people hear me speak like this, like you are, in a way, somewhat influenced by you, by the way, <laughs> but. When, when people hear me speak like this, they often think that I'm being uh, nasty or vengeful or trying to undermine their truth. Um, and then they hear something very strange come out of me, uh, which is that although this is not a historical document and although there is a great deal of deception in it and it was deceptively assembled, it does not mean that there is not truth in it. There is truth in it. <clears throat> just one that's must exactly decode it. Right. You're exactly right. There is truth, and that's what I have discovered about the whole New Testament story. Is it's incredibly uh, pregnant with profound truth, and, and it's telling you something right in your face. But you're looking at the whole subject uh, through a different different lenses, so you don't see it. I mean, something that's in your face and obvious, but you just don't see it yet. Why? Because you have been born and raised into a culture that has taught you over the years to be in compliance and follow what everyone else is doing, be like everyone else, <clears throat> and then you will have plenty of friends and they will love you, and you will have plenty of uh, family and friends and and the whole world, will, you know, you will be like the world and the world will love you because you, you are like the world. Is. Unless, of course, you have been picked by the spirit. That's what happens. You don't decide anything. But God picks you, so to speak. And so if the spirit has, has picked you and, and causes you to wonder about things and causes you to see things you weren't looking for, and you begin to uh, learn through spiritual experiences that something is going on here. 
and I'm being led to see something I wasn't seeing before. Now, all of a sudden, you're beginning to awaken from your lethargic sleep because you were in the dark. And I've given this example before, <clears throat> that if you are sound asleep, and you're very, very tired, and you're sound asleep in your bedroom, and someone slips into your bedroom very quietly and comes next to you uh, and turns on a 600-watt bulb <clears throat> next to you, your first and natural human reaction is to jump and turn away from the light. That's only a normal, normal reaction. But then, uh, then you're going to be very angry that somebody purposely came into your bedroom while you were sleeping, and not to do something nice for you, but to scare you with a 600-watt bulb. And that's not funny. You don't make friends that way. <clears throat> and so, therefore, what they have done is they have made an enemy of you. They've caused themselves to be your enemy, doing something like that in your personal bedroom. And so that's what happens today when you have someone who is very bright and is trying to show you something that they're trying to educate you. <clears throat> and he comes into your life. <clears throat> and you're sound asleep, you've never looked at anything. You don't know from nothing about much of anything. You just live from one day to the next like, like everybody else and never knowing, never questioning anything. But somebody comes into your life who's highly educated in a subject and begins just to talk with you about something you've never heard before, and it, all of a sudden it dawns on you that he's right what he's saying, and you've never heard it before. And so, therefore, you wake up, you know. Well, yeah, now that you've woken up because there was a bright light and because, of, you know, even in humans, if we get somebody who's really very, very bright, we say he's brilliant. Yeah, well, if he's brilliant and he's come into your life and you've been sound asleep in the dark for so long, he's going to look like a 600-watt bulb next to you and it's not going to be very funny to be awakened and woke up that you know that 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 way. And so now you're going to have to deal with the fact that you waking up to the fact that you've been asleep all your life. All and right. someone and who came into your life awoke you up, and now it finally dawned on you the word for the sun coming up to bring light. It finally dawned on you how much you don't know. Right. And look, in fairness to those that protest when they are enlightened rather suddenly, I mean, if we just think about the physical reality here, uh, where if you're in a dark room and you are sleeping, your eyes are closed and someone does suddenly walk in with a very bright light, that can be painful and cause your mood to become rather foul. So, uh, you know, anybody who can bet on it can have that problem. So, so this is why I don't get upset when people get angry that I have made them uncomfortable in the darkness that they have become comfortable in. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and this is the attitude that, uh, that I believe you take as well. And uh, quite honestly, this is something that, that needs, that needs a, a bit, a bit more encouragement that when you do find, uh, you know, some of this relative truth that does take a bit of time to get to, I mean, like you said, uh, the, the human animal, if you will, does not come out of its mother, much like a horse or a calf, you know, a cow, any animal almost can suddenly walk within a very short amount of time, can begin to feed itself. Yes, it may still require some of mother's milk, but, you know, instinctively, they instantaneously have a much better chance at taking care of themselves. Instantly yeah. and, instant, and instinctively both. And uh, I'm going to take this break now. Because I think it's uh, extremely relevant to, to break it off at this point and allow people to sort of chew on this mentally for a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, why? Because Jordan Maxwell is uh, continuing this series with me on religion. And it is extremely important uh, to get these things together and to put them together in exactly the way that you are. Now, what is also fascinating here? is that uh, you talked about the lenses through which people see things. Now, we, we, I've just given you the analogy about turning on a light, and that could hurt anybody, give you a headache. 
Uh, certainly it does and maybe puts you in a bad mood. But here's the other thing to consider, that if you have walked around your entire life with red lenses, see, I wear glasses every day, so glasses are reality for me. But if my lenses were always red, and I were handed one of the uh, standard Bibles that are printed, a lot of them have all of Jesus' words in red. Um, yep. If I'm walking around with red lenses and I open up those books, you know, it may look as though there is nothing there when something is written in red. Not because there is no ink on the page, but because of the lens that I've allowed to be over my eyes for so Precisely. long that yep. I've become accustomed to. And, you know, Jordan, I'll let you uh, finish that thought. But isn't that it, it, it kind of goes both ways? You know, there, there's been a darkness. So therefore, there was nothing to observe. You shine some light. But then also there's these lenses, which uh, in my analogy here, you could have red lenses placed on your eyes and therefore not see the red writing, if you if you will. Uh, this is a very simple color scheme. So one could visualize it as they're thinking about what you're saying. But I, I think both of these things, not only has there been a bit of darkness, but there has been things which have been hidden in plain sight because of the lenses placed over the eyes. Now, what are those lenses? The language and the culture. And it's also very, very uh, necessary to examine the fact that the word cult is in the word culture. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And also, if you were in a boat and you fell off the boat and you're drowning, and I and I get a rope and tie it to a uh, <clears throat> into a lifesaver, and I throw it out at you to, to to grab onto, and it hits you in the head. And now you're you're yelling at me that I hit you in the head. That hurts. <clears throat> I was trying to save your life. I'm trying to save you. I didn't mean to hit you in the head, but my God, I was trying to do something to save you. Because if if I don't hit you in the head. You got nothing, and you're drowning. So, you know, sometimes when you're trying to help people to wake up, they don't want to hear it. Well, that's true. But we have another hour where we're going to hear you, Jordan. And this discussion on religion, this series, that short break there. And Jordan Maxwell is continuing the series with me. This is part two, and this is the second hour of part two. So if you have missed it, uh, I do advise you go back, no matter where you're getting it from. If you're getting it from my feed, okay, it's at Ocelli.com, and you can find part one. Uh, there already, and you'll find the other parts later on, but also if you're at YouTube, I'm sure that I put it up there, and I have offered it to anyone who wishes to replay it or use it on their networks. We are putting this out to anyone and everyone who can get their ears around what's happening. <laughs> so if you have ears to hear, we want to make sure that uh, you're able to, and we thank you for joining us this night. As I said, this is only part two, and where we left off with Jordan was really uh, an interesting place, because this is the place I often get to when I'm asked to discuss this subject. Uh, not quite, not quite with the amount of time that Jordan has studied the subject, certainly, and uh, partially, in fact, built on some of what I have learned from him over time. But uh, still, this is a, a unique opportunity, and uh, I'd like to continue on, just basically turn it back over to Jordan and let him continue, uh, because this is exactly the kind of thing that uh, that needs to be heard, needs to be understood. And uh, not not in the way that we've understood many other things in the past, but uh, with, with new lenses on and with new light in the room, if you will. So uh, without any further ado, Jordan, please continue. Yes. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. <clears throat> uh, the word God, G-O-D, is simply the word dog spelled backwards. And so when you, and I remember many years ago, a professor saying to me, if you're going to use terms, uh, first of all, define your terms, uh, because maybe what you think a word means is not what other people are understanding the word to mean. And so define for us what you're talking about. So when you talk about God and you worship God, the very word worship goes back to a maritime admiralty uh, banking uh, terminology. Uh, and that's a whole series we could get into another time. 
but everything in our system of government and, and religion and banking is all based on maritime admiralty or based on the law of water. And so that's a whole subject, and, and I kind of wish we could go into that, but it's too big right now. But it's based on water. Why? Because you are a water product. When your mother, uh, when you were born, your mother's water broke. And so you came out of her water. And therefore, anything that comes out of water that's alive is a maritime admiralty product by law. And so everything is based on water. Your money, we say your money run, goes through your hands like water. No, money is water according to international maritime law. Maritime is talking about the sea. Mare, maritime is the sea. So the law of the sea is the law of water. The law of money is the law of the, of, of, the law of money is the law of water. So when you say money goes through your hands like water, no, money is water. It's a liquid asset. It's the cash flow. Uh, and, and so why do you have banks? Well, you have banks on both sides of a river. It's called a river bank. And what does a river bank do? It directs the flow of the currency. Because your, your, you know, your money is called currency. Why? Because it's a current. It's the ebb and flow of a current. You get money in, the waves come in, then they crash and the waves go out. So you get money coming in and the money goes out. And the money comes in and the money goes out. And that's why, like in, uh, uh, you know, in money, it's like breathing. You breathe in, you get money in, and then you breathe out and you put money out again. So it's an ebb and flow of, of water. And so that's why we have everything is in, uh, we, we always add the word to so many of our words. We always add the word ship, like dealership and friendship and, and scholarship and, uh, courtship and, and dealership. I mean, think about the hundreds of words that end in ship. Well, there's a word called worship. When you worship God, comes from a maritime admiralty word, ship, S-H-I-P, worship. Wor, it comes from the word worth, W-O-R-T-H, worth. And worth is the value of something. And you may have a different value system than I do. Some things are very important to you, I don't care about. But it's, it's therefore whatever. Whatever it is that you put a high value on, you put a very big and high worth uh, on, uh, it becomes your worship. And so, therefore, you understand worship is nothing more than putting a high value on something. So we call it your worship. If you put a high value on fast cars, then you are worshiping fast cars. And so put a high value on making a lot of money, then we say you're worshiping money. Worship means the worth of a thing. So when you get into the worship of God is the worth of the idea. What is it worth? And so in the ancient Greek world, God was spelled T-H-E-O-S. Or T H E D is God in Greek. Theos, T H E O S, or T H E. So therefore, the is a word for God, but it can also mean something godly or something very important like God, something superior like God. So if I happen to be working for the United States government, and you happen to be working and with talking about our jobs and you say well I work for this man and I say I'm working for the man you work for a man I work for the man and if you have a car uh, you know and you show me your car and I got a Rolls Royce you say I've got a car and I say yeah well I have the car the implies important higher, higher in, in importance so 
God is higher in importance in mankind's life. So the whole idea in Greek is, this, if you're talking about God, is T-H-E or T-H-E-O-S. Now, uh, the study of God, if you want to study about God, ology is a word for study, like biology and psychology, ology is the study, and put the TH in front of it, and becomes theology. Why is the study of God? So now you begin to see why uh, we also have something in our world called a theater. People go to theaters all the time, never realizing the word theater comes from a God show. You're going to see a show and it's in a theater. And so what are you doing when you get, uh, you're going to a theater? Well, this is what a church is. A church is a theater. You go in and you pick a seat wherever you want, wherever you're comfortable, where you can see well, and then, uh, you do, and, and there's going to be a show. And so you just sit there and are entertained in the, in the church and, Unlike the other theaters, you have to pay to get in. But with the church, it's also a theater of events. But you, they'll, they'll pass the they'll pass the hat later, and you'll pay for it. But uh, but that's the idea. When you go to church, it's a theater. God is T H E in Greek. So when you begin to understand the theater is a God show. And I'm reading some of this, and I'm trying to remember some of this, too, that uh, the Greeks had what they called an open-air theater. In the ancient Greek world, they had open-air theater. And that was where the people would go and watch plays. We go and watch movies and, and live performances in a theater. Well, that's what the Greeks did. The ancient Greeks would go to an open-air theater, and they would teach the people through uh, through uh, their plays about what was moral and what was not, what was right and what was wrong, and, and how to live and how not to do and what to not to do. And so the people would learn about God, and they would learn about living with each other, what not to do and, and, and how to live. So it was called an open-air theater. And... Um, so the idea is that we have a church. Uh, today we go to church. But the word church, you, uh, so many people in, in Christianity uh, go to church, but they do not know where the word church comes from. I mean, Christians will tell you all about Jesus Christ, but they have no real understanding of what the word Christ really means and where it came from. They think it is a position, a Christ is a position before God. No, Christ has nothing to do with a position before God. The word Christ goes back to an ancient Greek word for oil. Even today, Crisco has a, uh, I mean, Pillsbury has a Crisco oil. Crisco oil is actually Christo. And Christo becomes in Latin Crisco. And so we have a Crisco oil, or Christo, or Christo, or Christ. Christ means oil. And the, and, the, and the connection with Christ and oil is the fact that the kings and queens and all the royalty and all the holy men of the Bible all were called anointed. And even today, the Queen of England or, or any any. Any one of the uh, mentally disordered, uh, inbred goofballs over there that call themselves royalty, when they become king or queen or, or some high official, we see them as anointed. And they, will, they, they take a big plate with oil and they have a big silver spoon. That's why they were born with a silver spoon. And a silver spoon, they collect up the oil in the spoon and pour it on the head of the, of the, uh, of the queen and she is now said to be anointed queen well if you look back in the bible that's what they did you know when when uh, different people would be anointed in the bible it said that the, the high priest would pour oil on their head and then they became anointed 
And so the word anointed has to do with sex. It's a sexual term. But happily, most people don't know that. But anyway, we could get into all of those terms and words later. But uh, our word church comes, the very word, as I said, most people going to church have no idea where the word came from. The very word church goes back and can be traced back to a Greek goddess named Circe, C-I-R-C-E. Circe was an ancient Greek goddess of the Middle East and the ancient Greek world. And so when uh, the when the uh, the Pope, the Vatican, sent the Crusaders, which was a Masonic order, the Masonic order inside the Catholic Church, uh, they became known as Crusaders. And so they were sent into the Middle East to kick the Islamic uh, peoples out of Jerusalem and give it back to what the Pope felt was his. That was Jesus' uh, home, so it had nothing to do with Islam. So we need to kick the Islamic out and take it over for Christianity. And so when the uh, so when the Knights Templars, the Masonic Order, went over into the Middle East uh, and fought with the uh, Islamic uh, peoples and kicked them out, uh, but they when they came back, they had learned a lot. Uh, the, the, the armies had learned a lot living in the Middle East and fighting. They had learned about the, how the Middle Eastern and the Arabic people fight, all their poisons and, and, their, and their knives, and how they believe what they believe in their religions, what their alcohol, their drinks were like. So the, the, the soldiers, they pretty much uh, you know, learned a lot being at war in the Middle East. And when they came back into Europe, they brought a lot of those ideas and belief systems and, uh, and, and ideas back with them into Western world. And so, uh, so they brought back with them uh, the worship of a goddess that they learned about in the Middle East. And that goddess was Circe, C-I-R-C-E. And in the Middle East, Circe, the goddess, was called Mother Circe. And so when the Crusaders came back with this new idea of a goddess called Circe, uh, later on the, they ended up in Scotland, these Knights Templars. And so in Scotland, the word Circe is Kirk, K-I-R-K, or K-E-R-K, Kirk. And so Kirk is Circe in, in, uh, in the ancient language. Circe was a goddess, but Kirk is Circe in, in Scottish. But, uh, and so she became known as Mother Circe in Scotland. But then when, uh, when the church picked up on Mother Circe in England, now the British, uh, the English people, took Circe or Mother Kirk and call the church, C-H-U-R-C-H. So Mother Church was actually Mother Kirk, which was actually Mother Circe. And Mother Circe was a Greek god who was known as the goddess of occultism, mysticism, uh, magic, drugs, uh, a dark and evil goddess who could trick you into believing things, feed you poisons or feed you uh, uh, narcotics and, and trick you into getting you to come into her home. A lot of this you find in the Iliad uh, and, and um, Jason and the Argonauts and all that stuff going back into the ancient Greek. But the bottom line is Mother Circe was an evil goddess who dealt with black magic, occultism drugs and she would uh she would uh bring you into her home she would open the doors to her home and you would see all of these wondrous things with music and candles and and all these rituals going on and you'd be and then you would enter into her home and then once you're in there she would lock the door behind you shut the doors and lock it and then she would but uh, she would mysteriously, somehow or another, through the black arts, through occultism, she would take your mind. 
she would she would take your mind away from you and you're under the power of drugs and alcohol and whatever else in her in her occult religion and then while you were under the influence of the occultism of mother Cersei in her home she then could feed on you she would eat you she would she would feed on you and you became a, a meal for her and so that's where we get Mother Cersei, Scotland, Mother Kerr, England, Mother Church. And this is what Mother Church has done. She she opens up her doors and with candles and strange rituals and and chants and all kinds of strange uh, other world uh, presence it puts people in mind of being very spiritual, very holy. And so they go to church, never realizing church is Mother Kirk, Mother Circe, which is uh, black arts, occultism, and mysticism, and, and druggery. And so, Well, one interesting thing here, Jordan, and, and this is a, a great point at which to bring this up, it is to my mind this evokes the idea that a circus is Say also again. a circus. Uh-huh. You know, the that's circus where the word comes from. with the peanuts and everything else. That's where the word church comes from. But see, now you think about a circus. First of all, the three ring circus. Very interesting that there's got to be three I rings. I was going to say that. That was my next comment. Uh, it, it gives us the word circus. Circle right. or circus. But what's interesting to me is as you go forward, though, I, I want to just enter this because I'm not sure if you're going to go here because we didn't, you know, we didn't script any of this. We didn't plan any of this. But here's what's curious to me is that the circus is one thing, and, and you're going to go into that. But yeah. I also remember a building called the Circus Maximus, yeah, which was also the great place. This is all about entertainment, right? That's so right. entertainment to what? Get you to suspend your disbelief, get you to engage and become yeah. part of the yeah. entertainment circle. And I'm wondering, you know, that if people don't understand that the church and the entertainment industry – serve the same purpose because that's the Romans got it from the Greeks, didn't they? When they built the that's circus. Exactly Maxis. Right. Mm -hmm. And the modern, the more modern tradition, although maybe it's not as prevalent as it was a generation or two ago, but still the modern premise exists where there's a circus, right? And that's this right. is meant to show you a lot of strange and interesting things that you will not see outside of the confines of that tent. Almost miraculous things, <laughs> exotic animals and uh, fascinating things that, you know, one could experience through drugs if they take the right ones. Uh, but, you know, you could see people flying where on very thin ropes and things like that and doing things that most people are not capable of even doing. You know, very specialized behaviors, the trapeze and all of these things. It seems yep. interesting to me that all of it kind of starts to make a lot more sense That's when right. you understand this route. So please continue. But I wanted to just tell you what you were provoking in my mind as I was listening to you. Well, so Circe, C-I-R-C-E, Mother Circe, uh, gives us a word also, circle and circus. And that's why you have a three ring circus, a circles. So you have a three ring circus. Yeah, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Osiris, Isis, Horus. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All the religions have a triune God. It's a three ring circus. It goes back to Circe. It's a religion. And people buy into all of these religions and never realizing it comes from an ancient source that you have no idea about. And then you bought into it, never actually doing any research to find out where the ideas have come from. And so uh, I have said that if you are going to pack it, you're going to send a package, uh, a big box in the mail. You go into the garage and you get us some rope and you tie up the box with the rope and, and, and that will probably be all right. That'll probably do for what you need. But if you're going to go into the garage and take that rope and go up on the end of a 10 story building and tie it off and hang on that rope off the 10 story building, then you better go back and look at the integrity of that rope before you go hanging your life on it. 
It may be all right for a box of mailing, but it may not be all right to hang your body on it because your life depends on the integrity of that rope. So the same thing is true in what you believe. You think you believe something, but until you've actually educated yourself and gone back into the history of what it is you are, you are involved in, and what you have joined or been born and raised into, and you begin to see where this stuff has really come from, not what you thought it was. That's why I say all the time, the world is not what you think it is. Nothing works the way you think it does. And I mean nothing. The police are not here to do what you think they do. Education and colleges and universities don't do what you think they're doing. And government is not here to do what you think they're doing. There's a whole different world out there, as George Carlin says, it's a big club. Then you ain't in it. So you need to back off and take stock of what you are doing and what you believe and where you think you're going. And then you'll find out you've been lied to from day one. And your entire life you've been praying to God and hoping and praying, never realizing for a moment you're just praying to an ancient God of Rome. You're you're praying to some ancient Greek god, some ancient Babylonian, Sumerian, Phoenician, Canaanite god that's been dressed up, repainted, and sold to you as something very holy and righteous, and you never realize for a moment that you've been had. So I'm trying to wake people up to find out where their ideas and their religions have actually come from. And this is what I, you know, we could talk for hours about this subject, but there's a whole encoded story in, uh, in, in Christianity that I think is very interesting because it really tells you the real story once you see it. Right. Now, so, as, you know, as you're going through this, Jordan, I want, you, I want to let you know that uh, you've actually simultaneously provoked uh, similar questions from live <laughs> listeners. Uh, which uh, which I'm going to tie together for you here and ask together. So uh, this is for three of you who asked this question uh, almost exactly at the same moment, in, apparently, um, yeah. which is, uh, you know, ab about the Vatican, by the way. Uh, and it is, uh, do you believe that the Vatican rules the world as it stands, or has it uh, simply been one of the main architects of the control system which has been put into place therefore it actually serves something else so the the, the two questions together are yes. uh you know does the vatican rule the world or has it simply been the mechanism by which the architecture was created for the control mechanism of religion in general I, that, think that that I think the answer to that, according to my understanding, and I'm not the world's foremost authority, but I've been looking at it for almost 60 years, I would say uh, number two is what I would say. It's, it, it's not running the whole world, but in point of fact, it does say it owns the world. And all of the leaders around the world, from China and Russia and Africa and any other countries on the earth, they all must go to Rome sometime in their political career and kneel down before the Holy Father. Uh, and he represents God, so he's a God Father. Get it? And this is why the Italian mob and the Sicilian and Italian mafiosi all come from Italy. Sicily, Corsica, all of the international criminal organizations, and they, you know, and so the, the Pope is actually, uh, you know, he's connected to God, and he's a holy father, so he's a godfather, and so I think that the Pope and the Vatican is actually in, a, is in the ultimate position for world control and world domination, but I also agree with the second part is that it, it merely represents something even far more sinister. It represents another power even higher that uses the Vatican to dominate the earth because all of our laws 
all of our British laws, British maritime laws, our British corporate laws, our American laws, all the laws that we, we live by and, and all the institutions of government, FBI, CIA, especially CIA and NSA, those are all Catholic organizations. Well, especially, right. especially, point, point of fact, yeah. point, point of fact really quickly, uh, the, the Pope at one point declared, and I don't remember which Pope it was, but I do remember reading a papal decree, I guess they call it a papal bull at one point, that yep. uh, stated that effectively the souls of all the men on the earth are, uh, are, are effectively the property, the responsibility of the Catholic Church, which is the Vatican. I mean, uh, that's right. You know, I don't remember exactly which one it was, but I do believe if one were to search it out, they could find yes. the uh, the papal decree that says precisely this. Jordan, am I right or wrong? That's exactly correct, and that's why uh, the kings in Europe and, and and all the big shots that run the world, the kings especially, would tell you that they have a divine right of kings, a divine right. And so divine right implies that God anointed you. God put you there. Uh, well, when, when, when did we ever see God put any of the British, uh, uh, you know, who have a divine right of kingship? Though what they're talking about when they say divine right means that they have been anointed and agreed upon by the Pope. When the Pope uh, decides that he likes you, and that he can use you because of your special special activities, he will anoint you to be the king of England. And now you, as the king, can crawl on your knees and go before the Pope and bow before the Pope and kiss his ring. And every time I see people, a politician from all over the world, just go on the web and type in uh, kissing the Pope's ring and see how many hundreds and hundreds of political leaders and mafiosis and gangsters and international illuminatis and all kinds of dark demonic people all on their knees before the Pope kissing his ring. And so it, it puts me in mind of Godfather One when when you see the old man going in to visit the Godfather and he's standing there and he's bending down to kiss the Godfather's ring. That's exactly what they do in Rome. If you're a politician, you go before the Holy Father, who represents God. He's the God Father, and you, you better bend down and kiss his ring. And so that's the name of the tune. So I say that the Vatican is the home office of international Illuminati criminality on the earth. We know the, the Vatican and the Pope has been involved. Popes all through the history of the church have been involved in drug running, uh, white slavery, prostitution. Even the, the, if you go back to the history books, the encyclopedias, it will tell you that the whole idea of the nuns, where you were bringing women into the church, nuns were always originally the nuns of the Catholic Church. Back in the Middle Ages were the private prostitutes of the of the higher hierarchy in the church the hierarchy of the church the pope and the cardinals uh they would uh, keep their own women and so they were called uh, they were called uh, nuns and so the nunneries were actually prostitution houses for the the clergy of the roman catholic church and this is why uh today <clears throat> You know, the nuns, as a matter of fact, the word nun in, a, in, in, in the Hebrew is a fish because Jesus was a great fisherman. So a nun is a fish. And the more you begin to see that, uh, you know, the whole idea of nuns, they wear black robes, they wear black dresses, black. Why? Because the Catholic priest wears black robes. And uh, and why? Because Darth Vader wears a black robe. And... and uh, <laughs> uh, What's his name? Dracula wears a black robe. Everything is done in black robes. Why? Because the planet Saturn, that beautiful planet with the rings, is we call it Saturn. Saturn was the god of the black robe. 
So when you see people like uh, like uh, rabbis, <clears throat> Catholic priests, nuns wearing black robes, when kids graduate from uh, from high school or university, they wear a black robe. They wear on their head a square motto board. It all connects to the planet Saturn. And Saturn is connected to the concept of Satan, Saturn. And and as do the judges' robes. As do the judges' robes. My my specific reference, just so uh, because I was asked about this really quickly, is yeah. Unum Sanctum, which was uh, by uh, Pope Boniface, I guess it's pronounced uh, B O N I F A C E V A, and that was in 1302. If you want to look that up, and uh, so I just wanted to, to let people know that this is not something that I'm imagining and Jordan is agreeing to. Uh, that this is in this is part of the publicly known declarations, and uh, you know you can you can find it through Catholic websites if you like. You can look through their own doctrine to see this. This is uh, literally described uh, in English as one God, one faith, one spiritual authority, uh, yep. literally issued by the Church, the Pope, uh, yep. as as their head. So I just want to make that very clear. Yep. And uh, again, the robes, the black robes. See, again, the, the, the courts, you got black robes. Well, exactly. I was going to say, when you go into court, the judge wears a black robe. But that's for when, uh, if you're a Catholic and you're in church, you're sitting there waiting for the service to begin. And when the, and when the, uh, the, the priest walks out in the black robe, everyone rises. And you don't have to be told. It's just that you rise when you see the priest come in. That's the way it works in the Catholic church. You rise, and uh, and so um, that's the same thing you do when the when the judge walks into the courtroom. Everybody, everyone rise. Why? Because the the judge is wearing a black robe, which represents the planet Saturn. Saturn was the god of the black robe, and when you begin to see the connection between Saturn and day god. The Catholic Church today, the Pope represents not Jesus. He does not represent Jesus. He represents an ancient God that you know nothing about. The Catholic Church, when you see the Pope, he represents the worship of Dagon. It's spelled D-A-G-O-N, Dagon. Dagon is an ancient Phoenician Canaanite God of the sea. And he comes out of the ocean. And, and taught men uh, how to live, taught men all the holy uh, holy scriptures. He taught men all about God, etc. And then he would turn around and go back into the sea. And so he was referred to as Dagon, the sea god, or the god from the sea. And that's why today he was referred to as the fish god, the fish man. And Jesus was the great fisherman. And so that's why the Pope wears what we call the Pope's mitre. That strange tall hat that he wears is a fish head. It's called the, it's called the Pope's mitre, but it's actually the head of Dagon. Again, it's spelled D-O-G-A-N, D-A-G-O-N, D-A-G-O-N, Dagon. Dagon is a fish god of the Babylonians and Sumerians and the Phoenician Canaanites. And so the Pope is wearing the, the, the fish head of Dagon, the fish god, but he also wears the Jewish yarmulke. That's an interesting connection there that most people don't know anything about. Why does the Pope wear the little yarmulke that the Jews wear? And why do the cardinals wear the little yarmulke? Uh, like the Jews where, my God, there's a whole story here connecting the Roman Empire with the Jewish uh, people and the Jewish religion with the Romans. And the, and there's another connection that you, most people are going to think I'm totally crazy on this one, unless you actually do what I do, go to a library and start studying the subject, and then you'll see what I'm talking about. There's a big connection that's always been there, but nobody realized it. I finally found that after 60 years of, of looking at it, it finally occurred to me. Because I've been looking at these symbols all my life, but it finally occurred to me 
the, of what I was looking at <laughs> after doing it for so many years. There is a big connection between the German people, Germany, and the people we call Germans, and what we call Jewish. Jewish and German are connected in an occult way that you don't know anything about. You probably never heard anything about it. But the Pope is wearing the uh, the yarmulke of the Jew. He represents the Roman Empire. And today, the Holy Roman Empire was referred to as uh, Germany. Germany was referred to as the Holy Roman Empire. And then when you see the connections between Judaism, worshiper of the sun, God, uh, the Jews were worshipers of the sun, God, that was a... You know, these are all things I wanted to get into next week. But the Jews were worshippers of the sun god of Egypt. Well, so were the, so were the Germans. They were very interested in the sun gods of, uh, of, of Egypt. And so the name of the Hebrew god, the god of the, of the Jews, is called Yahweh. And they say that uh, that name is so holy that they can't use that name in normal speech. But they have given you an abbreviation, which they say is, is better. Just If you want to talk about the almighty, absolute, almighty God of the Hebrews, that God's chosen people. And if you want to talk about their God, the absolute sovereign God of the universe, uh, you can't use his name. He's so holy. But they give you four letters. And so in every synagogue, and as the word is every, every synagogue on the earth, in any country you go to, you will always see on the altar and in the synagogue, you will see a round sunburst. It's always a symbol of the sun. Every synagogue on the earth, period. They have the, they have the round sun symbol, which is the sun symbol for the sun god of Egypt. But within the sun, on all synagogues, you will see the four letters for the name of God uh, so that you don't have to pronounce God's name. You can use the four letters. And so there's the four Hebrew letters that, that is called the Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. And so uh, most people know what Tetragrammaton means. It's the four letters for the Hebrew God, which is an abbreviation. Well, look at the word tetragrammaton. It's tetra, which is four, gramma, which is a letter, like A, B, Z, D, tetra, four, letter as gramma, and aton, A, T, O, N, tetragramma, aton. Aton was the Egyptian sun god, and he rolled across heaven, and the ancient, uh, ancient Egyptian uh, mysteries, uh, religions, they talk about the Aton. Well, the Aton in Germany was, uh, at, uh, was symbolized by the swastika. The swastika is, everybody pretty well knows, the sun is a sun symbol. The swastika is the sun as it rolls across sky, as it rolls across the sky. And so the swastika represents the Aton. Well, so does the, it's a sun symbol. Well, of course, in the synagogues, you have, uh, you know, the, the Jewish God, and he's inside the sun symbol, and it's called the Tetragramma Aton. And then you say, well, wait a minute, what's the connection between the Jewish God and the swastika? Well, if you go to Israel, there are, there are, uh, uh, synagogues that have on the floor of these synagogues. I didn't do it. I'm just telling you. If you go to Israel, there are there are uh, synagogues which have on the floor, as you walk in, big, huge uh, uh, swastikas. And so you ask the question, what are the Jews uh, uh, doing with putting swastikas on the floor of their synagogues? Well, we're not supposed to answer that, besides we're not even supposed to see it. It's not important. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. But once you understand, wait a minute, there's something going on between the Jewish religion, the Nazi party, the German people, and today Israel. 
And then when you go back and look at the, you know, the history of where the ancient peoples came from and what their worship of the sun was, oh my God, we can, we can go on for hours about this, but there, I'm just bottom line telling you that there is a connection between Judaism, Nazism, the swastika, and the tetragramma Aton, all being the, the sun god of ancient Egypt. And this is a far bigger story than you even begin to suspect. Well, what's was, amazing to me, Jordan, about that is that uh, you're, you're talking about Yahweh, you're talking about the sun god, you're talking about, but you know what's fascinating is that I am rather confused as I objectively attempt to read what they call their scripture. Uh, because I see mentions and references that look to me like Baal worship or Baal worship, B-A-A-L. Uh, I see Azeroth represented in their scriptures. I see other gods represented in what they are calling their scriptures. Um, yep. And, and there's, it's not, I mean, I brought up two, you brought up one uh, or two just now. It seems to me as though there is a composite of many. Look at, Judy, look at yeah. Judaism itself has uh, seven parts to Judaism, seven different parts to Judaism. And there's seven different religions made into one. During the Middle Ages, they, they took seven different ancient religions and wove them together and, and put them together and called it today Judaism. But most Jews are not aware of that. And most people uh, in the world are not aware that Judaism is nothing more than an amalgamation of seven different ancient uh, prehistoric and ancient religions that have been molded into one. <clears throat> And uh, so that that's a whole story in itself. One of the uh, ancient religions is um, is the worship of the moon. That's one of the oldest uh, religions connected to Judaism is the worship of the moon god. The moon god in the ancient world, in the ancient Arabic world, ancient Egypt, there was a moon god. And today, that, that moon god is still part of what we call the Judaism today. And that moon god was called, if you look it up in the dictionary, Encyclopedia of Religion, you will find that the moon god of the ancient Arabic world was called Sin, S-I-N. Not that you've done something bad and you committed a sin. No, that was the name of the moon god. S-I-N, look it up in the dictionary. Sin, and it will tell you, was an ancient Arabic moon god. Today, sin is referred to as Allah, the moon god. But, uh, but originally, the moon god in Arabia was called Sin. And so this is why today the Jews go to Sin Agog. Because the uh, Sin Agog is the house of worship of the god Sin. The moon god. So we know that the Jews today have a, uh, a a lunar calendar based on the moon. And so you know, we say that those tribes of Israel, well, the Native American tribes also count their days from the many moons. Not suns, but many moons. Well, right. And, and the thing is that what's interesting here about tonight's presentation is that this is the foundation upon which we are told Christianity is built, right? That is of the course. Old Testament. This is the New Testament. And it's yep. only because this happened after this that uh, that we have, you know, this point of reference. And I think that uh, in understanding what has actually happened in the development of Christianity, uh, you must take a look at the alleged foundation for it. And that is the Old Testament. That is the Torah. That is, right? So Yeah, but, but I've been saying that for you know, for years. And, and all, all I'm getting is just people looking like a deer in the headlights. I'm trying to explain to you, nothing just popped in out of nowhere. Everything has a history. And so go back and look at the history of the Jewish religion. And, and, and I can, you know, I can tell you some stuff about the Jewish religion that'll shock you. 
but I am totally sure, this is my idea, but I've been doing this for many years, I'm totally sure, beyond the shadow of a doubt for myself, I've got all the proof I need, and I can present it to you in the next time we do two hours, all the proof to show that there was, in actual fact, historically, no ancient Judaism, period. There was no ancient Israel, never existed. Period. End of sentence. It never, ever existed. <clears throat> there was no Abraham. And all three major religions say that they are Abrahamic religions. Well, if they're all Abrahamic religions, they're all killing each other. So that should tell you something about Abraham. Uh, all three religions are murdering each other. World wars are being fought between the, the three major religions that claim Abraham. And then we find out there was no Abraham. Abraham never existed. <clears throat> Abraham and Judaism and, and the whole of Judaism and, and the worship of Abraham goes back to Hindu. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are Hindu religions. And there's a, there's a lot of the ancient Egyptian thrown in there. But basically, Christianity and Judaism are a Hindu religion. The Hindus had it first, and they still have it today. And so in, 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 in India, <clears throat> the highest ranking priests are called Brahmins because their God, the ultimate God of the Hindu is called Brahman. And so you have, you have Brahmins and then the Brahmin priesthood will tell you that they are a chosen priesthood, that they are referred to as God's chosen people and they are a Brahmin. And so you put an A in front of it because A Brahman. And A Brahman, because originally Abraham was not called Abraham, he was called Abram. Abram became Abraham. Well, a Abram is A B R A M. Ab Ram. Ab Ram. <clears throat> father is Ab A B is father, and Ram was the Ram god of, of Egypt. The Ram God you know, represented uh, the constellation of Aries, Aries the Ram. So the worship of Aries the Ram was Abram, A-B-R-A-M, Ab Ram, or Father, Father Ram. And so in India, you have Abram or Abraham. No, it's not Abraham. It's Brahman with an A, Abraman. And, and there was a goddess that was directly connected to the Brahmin religion. Her name was Sarah Swazi. And so you have Abram and Sarah, Abram and Sarah, or Abraham and Sarah. Now it's Abram and Sarah Swazi. It's Hindu. It goes back into an ancient, dark religious history thousands of years ago. But today, we don't care about that. That's all a bunch of nonsense. We don't care about that. We, we are the followers of Abraham. That's why we kill and rape and, and have pornography and child sacrifice. <clears throat> and, you know, and then we see what's going on in the Catholic Church with the pornography and the, and the boy stuff. And then we find out that it's okay for a 40-year-old or 50-year-old man to marry a little 8-year-old girl. And, uh, and, and they have child marriages all over the Middle East. And then you find out in the, in the Torah or in the Talmud, especially in the Talmud, there's all kinds of stuff about sexual connection between men, grown men, and four and five and six year old girls, etc. It's just complete with that. There's a lot of stuff out there talking about uh, how, uh, you know, if a man has sex with an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, it is not considered immorality at all. It's only natural and normal, and nobody gets hurt. <clears throat> and right. so then you find out the same thing is believed about the uh, altar boys. And why are they called altar boys? Because they're putting the boy on the altar, just like Abraham put his son on the altar to kill him. Right. I'm just telling you that there's a world of knowledge that's been hidden, and the word hidden in Latin is occult. Occult means hidden. So there's a world of occult knowledge about religion, 
government, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The whole world is lying in the power of a dark, sinister, and evil force that's been around for tens of thousands of years. And mankind is still crawling on his knees, kissing the ring of the Pope, and kissing the ring of the Godfather, and people are killing each other because of their belief systems, and nobody seems to know what's going on. Well, and that's what the, a world we live in. And that's the saddest part of it is that they don't recognize what the foundation is built upon. Today, uh, the ram's horn is still blown, you know, to signify certain the things. Part. Yeah, there the shofar is blowing the ram's horn. And, uh, yeah. you know, th th this is just some of the resonant evidence of some of what's gone on here. Ares is the god of war, depending on where it is you read about uh, him. And well, and then what about the, the Jews worshipping the golden calf? The golden the calf. The golden calf is actually Taurus, the bull, the constellation of Taurus, the bull. And, and, and the Taurus, the bull, represents the sun in the sky in the age of Taurus. And so the Taurus is the sun in the age of Taurus, and so it becomes the golden is the sun, golden calf. The calf is Taurus the bull. And so what's the next constellation after after Taurus the bull if it is an Aries, the ram? So uh, the Jews were, uh, were worshipping the golden calf. Well, now today they're worshipping Aries, the ram. So they're blowing the ram's horn. And right. then after, after Aries, the ram, what comes next? Pisces. Pisces is the two fish. And so the, uh, uh, that's interesting, too, is the two fish. Well, they, they, Israel, about five years ago, had a big news story that said that they found the oldest church ever built on in the world today. The oldest Christian church ever built was found in Israel in an area called Megiddo. Megiddo is to, has today the oldest church ever found, Christian church, and it's in Megiddo, Israel. And what did they find on the floor of the of this oldest church at Israel? And everybody agreed, America and England, everybody agreed. It's the oldest church ever done, first one ever done. And what is in the middle of the floor but the two fish of Pisces? And now we're getting ready to go into the new age of Aquarius. I'm telling you, nobody seems to have figured out how this dark system of world government, world religion, banking, international monetary systems, the uh, industrial military complex. My God, there's a world of knowledge. People just don't know. Well, that's and, uh, right. I've got I've got on my website. My website is Jordan Maxwell Show. If you go on my website, you need to put in the word show. S H O W. Jordan Maxwell Show. And on there you will see an advertisement for my research, Jordan Maxwell's Research Society. What that is is another website I have dedicated to putting all of my research on this second website. It's huge and it's going to get bigger. I've got thousands of more articles coming on to. I've got, uh, uh, I have on my research society audio, videos, uh, places to go for, for documents, books, ebooks, free ebooks, free documents. Uh, just an incredible array of like 15 or 16 different divisions of research on my on my Jordan Maxwell Research Society, which is cram packed with all kinds of documents and pictures proving everything I'm telling you. It's all there. So just go on Jordan Maxwell Show and make sure you add the word show. That's right, jordanmaxwellshow.com. That yep. is the only website that Jordan Maxwell himself is responsible for and right. uh, is part of. That's the truth. Uh, so let's keep that very clear, jordanmaxwellshow.com. It will be included along with some other references uh, from uh, tonight's discussion. We are out of time on this, but I do say that it is something that needs to be examined if you're going to base your entire life on a religious system of faith.
and people are going to debate whether all things should be based on this religious system of faith, then I think it is required of the individuals that, that say that this is their way of being, that they examine the foundations of it. And Jordan has certainly done that over the past two hours and shown us some things, some of them in plain sight, some of them hidden, coded in the language, some of them, I'm not sure how to come about uh, explaining where they are, but they are there. And there are many levels. And of course, there, this is only the beginning. So yes, jordanmaxwellshow.com altogether, those three things, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Com and the Research Society to click through and join that. You're going to have access to a tremendous amount of material, which is there. And as we discussed last time, a tremendous amount of material is still being added, very carefully curated and uh, created, especially uh, so that Jordan can share all of the knowledge that he has acquired, as well as the knowledge that he can point you to, the references, many, many bits of information there, uh, bits, forget about bits, terabytes of information that are there uh, available for you to go ahead and join the Research Society, but also, you know, just begin 